was for entertainment purposes only. And if you want true legal advice, contact your own lawyer. You were talking about practical <laughs> legal issues for employers, employees. Yeah, that, that's probably, and then, Todd, I want you really quickly, Todd, right after Denise finishes that, let's talk about ar- the arresting issue. Sure. Because yep, yep. Gavin Newsom brought up some things about. A lot of states have. And, and yeah, yes. a lot of states. We're going to talk about that in a minute, Denise. You're going to talk about some practical legal right. issues. Right. I mean, as an employer, you have to think about how, if you're not just going to lay off everybody and just step back, how do you put into place preventative measures to protect your staff? Uh, or your employees from um, the the virus. I mean, that's just a very practical concern. And it, it could be an American with Disabilities Act concern as well, because you may have to do some accommodation to keep your business running and to keep your employees working, correct? Trying, so, trying, yeah, we're all trying. Yes, yes exactly. So reasonable accommodation, it could be uh, remote access, right? They're going to work from home and they're going to re- work remotely. Well, what if you can't do that? You're, you're like my law firm. It's difficult to work remotely. How do you do that? I don't well, know. you can do it. Um, it's, it's a matter of putting in the money into technology. Well, get, to can be you able find that? I'm going to argue that because okay, my technology people, they're so busy right now. I can't even. They're, they're not even. We have an issue, just so you know, on our firm right now that we're having issues getting into our mainframe. And this was before the coronavirus, but they're so busy. Our tech company, we have a tech company. No, I totally they, agree. They, they don't, they're not getting it fixed, and we can't even work. They're outside. essential services. Yeah we, yeah, we can't do that right now. But go ahead. Exactly. So I think, um, I mean, it depends on the size of your of your company right. is going to be really important. But um, maybe having somebody that's in the company that's actually going to be the coordinator for it. Um, in my office, I did staggered hours, so nobody's in the office at the same time. That's a great idea. Yes, and so we've got a, a full-on plan for staggered hours. So do we. Good one. Um, the other thing that we did was, well, it's not quite complete. Folks that try to call my office right now, I'll get that fixed. Um, we have the answering machine, but it will be calling. You dial this number if you need to call and get to somebody right away right. or just leave a message. That's another way because then you can let your receptionist out. And, um, you, and the workers' comp, they're allowing, if you get the coronavirus during work, you can make a workers' comp claim. We're going to talk a little more about it when we come back from the break, but uh, stay with us. Time to get back to Radio Law Talk on RadioLawTalk.com and on your favorite radio station. So Denise was talking about uh, some practical legal issues for employers and employees with yeah. the coronavirus. Yeah, it's really important that the employers have hand sanitizers, tissues. They have increased cleaning of their public facilities, that they make sure that they're getting things sterilized, like the, the door handles and, and, you know, the desks and, you know, the bathroom and the kitchen um, uh, rooms. Um, what's also important, especially in the context for lawyers, is that you've got to make sure that the data that you have for your clients is being kept confidential and kept private. Now, in a remote setting, they're working from home, presumably. Does that mean that they can take files home with them and that what what are you going to do? In my, my attorneys can take files home with them, and this is what I tell them. Make sure you put the files in the trunk of your car. That's it. Make sure when you're transporting, it's in the trunk of your car. Because I have heard horror stories about people getting broke, their car getting broke broke into, and they're taking client files. Um, so that's an important thing. The other thing that I have done that is very important for employers to consider is don't put your data up in the cloud. Have your own network. And if you do that, when you do the remote access, the people are remote accessing directly to their desktops, and all of the client data stays inside the network. It doesn't go anywhere else. You don't have to worry about monitoring their laptops or their computers at home because they can't download. They can't print at home. They can't do any of that. It's all internal. To What about telling your employees they have to show up during – this quarantine, I guess. Yeah, I mean, you, I like, you like, can. You can actually, yeah. depending on if you're essential services. Essential services. That's um, right. You can make them show up, but you can also make them go home. You can. Um, it, and there's a difference. Well, if they're sick, you make them go home. You don't tell your teammates that the name of the person that's sick. You but tell you them, can test them too as they come in. We, you can take their temperature if they look like they have fevers. Yes, yes. You can ask them about medical information. But this is only in a pandemic moment. Right. This is right. not usual. Right. Well, I'm going to do that with all my lawyers coming in because I've got the I've got the thermometer. 
Yeah. What, what? Uh, bend over. Um, uh, uh, Kent. Uh, yeah. You know, yes. do the practical things that CDC. Uh, I'm afraid the thermometer is six feet long. Yeah, I know. Don't worry about it. Sorry. <laughs> what, what, one thing to one thing to keep in mind is. <laughs> <laughs> I just went right off the rails. Oh my right? god. Well, I don't want to get closer. I, I put it at the end of a PVC pipe. That <laughs> would be exactly the wrong thing to do as an employer. <laughs> oh, that's the wrong. Okay. I want to make sure I'm clear on that. <laughs> you don't want to do face-to-face meetings. You're going to want to set up teleconferences. You're going to want to keep everybody out of the office. Keep distance. The and best you and can. and avoid having the public at large come in. Yes. Um, I've staggered the hours of my employees so nobody's That's in smart. at the same time. Yeah. And I've, I, it took me a, like three days to make this plan in place. Um, Actually, I'm going to interrupt that. So we're we're doing the kind of the same thing. We have a big enough office that they. That we're going to limit it to, to two, maybe three. You want to be under six for sure, depending on the size. But they're in completely different parts of the office. Well, you yeah. can also have people access different doors to come in. That's true. So you can really limit the where they how they have to transport or around the office. Um, you should make anybody that's been sick. You should make them bring in a doctor's note. Right. That just makes common if you sense. Get into the doctor. Exactly, yeah. and you can even tell your you can tell your um, employees. You can't take your vacation. You have to avoid unnecessary travel. You can actually stop them from taking a vacation. Really? Yes. Because you don't want them out there getting exposed. Because once they go out, and there and there are employers that have the policy that if you leave or go do any travel at all, you have to self-quarantine at home for 14 days. Wow. That's happening as During well. During the pandemic. Uh, no, that's actually – well, yes. We're in a pandemic. Yes. Right. Just right. Yes. disease spread across multiple locations. Right. Right. We're yes. not in an epidemic necessarily you right. can also, unless you're in Italy. Right. You can also tell your employees that they cannot use public transportation. Wow. Yes. And, and, and one thing to keep in mind, everything that Denise is talking about is for a pandemic that has been declared a pandemic. Right. I mean, if you're if you're wondering as an employer, well, wh- when do I know that I have to implement these or can I do these things? It's when it's been declared. And in the last century, there have only been five declared pandemics. Which ones? Tell and me. the the pandemics. And again, this is from the EEOC's website. So they talk about this and they say of the five pandemics, the first was the Spanish flu in 1918. Yep. Then there was uh, followed by the milder Asian Hong Kong flus of the 50s and the 60s, the SARS outbreak in right. 2003, and the H1N1 outbreak in 2009. Those all rose to the level of a pandemic, so it's been 11 years since the last one. But I don't remember them going as extreme as they are on this one. I, I don't either, but my point is... Uh, we talk about these things that employers do, but you need to understand that it's not like you're going to run into this every day. So when you talk about preparedness, look, if somebody after the H1N1 decided, OK, we need to put this pandemic preparedness plan in place. We've got it. And they did that, say, in 2010. It was 10 years before they got to actually implement that. And. How much of that plan do you think they actually remember? It's something you got to review because you never know when it's going to come up, right? Exactly. I, I, I caught myself literally timing-wise. This, it, It's so weird. It felt like this year was going so fast. Everything was happening so fast. And then all of a sudden, right around March 2nd, everything slowed down to almost a crawl. And when this week, I've thought I have to have a plan in place and it took me three days to do the research it took me three days to come up with this plan and and I'm not that's not a joke it's I was I had anxiety wow. trying to develop the plan so I'm telling everybody out there do it early and have a plan have it written up have the staggered um, uh, scheduling so that the, the your your staff can take those off-site with them but what's interesting on this Denise and again, I, I was born in the si- early 60s. Cal was born in the 1920s. Early 50s. Um, but anyway, long story short, this is new. This is new stuff. I mean, not to this extreme have I seen uh, the government shut things down in a pandemic. Not an epidemic, but but this extreme of a pandemic in my lifetime. Well, and, and you think about it, like the fact that you said in your lifetime. Let's talk about when the... F- most, uh, I'm going to call it modern or recent uh, in the last 20 years pandemic came out was uh, 2003, which was, which was the SARS outbreak, right? Prior to that, 
you said, Fred, you were born in the 60s, right? Early 60s. That was the last time there had been one before SARS. But I don't remember SARS being this extreme to go home, lock down, yeah. you know, self. You it, know. Wasn't. It, it wasn't. wasn't. It, it wasn't. It wasn't. It was not. And, and, I, I, the and one, yet we lost, well, to be clear, we lost about 9,000 people to SARS. We did. Right. I mean, well, it was a big deal. One of, one of yeah. the things that the statistics are showing is that when it comes to SARS, H1N1 and those, the the mortality rate of infected people that actually end up uh, dying was much higher with those in terms of the percentage of people that got infected that ended up dying as opposed to the coronavirus. It infects a lot more, but a smaller percentage of the numbers that have been infected end up decide, dying. That's what the CDC is seeing. It's very odd. It's very different. But as we're talking about these measures that you should employ, I, I can't stress this enough. Highly recommend that you get guidance from if you have an employer attorney, if you have an attorney that oversees what you do or that you consult with this, you need to get guidance because your employment attorney should be on the cutting edge of what is required and how employers should be handling but this. I'm, tell, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna argue that. My, here's my argument. This has never been seen before. I see the government, you're suing because your employer didn't do this right, that right. The, the government is, is doesn't know what to do. The government is leaving things broad and open. The, the, good luck, I think it's gonna be a difficult time for lawyers to sue employers and sue people for not doing what was right during this time period when really everything's in flux. I remember last yeah, week, I, it, everything was so in flux. Employee, my employees are asking what to do. I said, I, I, you know, I'm trying to figure this out just like you guys are, and the government is. I don't think that the employer is going to be subject to lawsuits if they take these measures. I don't think, unless their measures are insufficient to protect somebody from a virus, um, in this type of a virus, it, they're not going to be subject to suit. But there is one piece where that could be subject to suit, and that is if you gather information about your employers, their medical, their their you know employees, temperatures, employees. employees, sorry, and all of that type of stuff. You want to treat that information confidentially and keep it separate from your regular employment files, oh, and and do okay. not put it in a, a a storage where other people have access. Right. You need to keep those files at home or somewhere. And and be very careful about the dissemination. Really quickly, if you are an employer, <laughs> my point is, if you are an employer and the there of anybody that has the most up to date advice as to what you should do, it would be your labor and employment attorney. That's the person you should be basing right. your guidance on. Right. Well, when we come back, we're going to talk a little more about this. Todd is going to talk about uh, about arrests during this time period of this pan- pandemic. What? is right and wrong and what may or may not happen and about bail. We'll be right back. So, uh, Denise, you said you wanted to talk one more thing about employers and employees. Yeah, I want to do, there's a difference between exempt and non-exempt employees. Um, Non-exempt employees are those employees that are basically wage and hour employees. Um, you don't have to pay them during the time they're not working, period. There's no, nothing requiring it. If you send them home, that's it. You don't have to pay them because they're not working. Um, the, you might have reporting times. You can put different things in it to make sure that they're working if they go off remote site and so that you pay them. But if you can show they're not working, you do not need to pay them. Um, the someone said something em- about though. The, someone said something about three days worth. You have to pay for uh, sick time allowed or something like that. I don't. I don't know. Well, that's a state law. That's There's different. A, okay. Yeah, they're trying to pass something federally, or they might have already. Yeah, they're but working on it. State law: yeah. how many hours you work, you get so many hours of sick time. That's yeah, under yeah, yeah. state. But um, it, and that's for all employees. That doesn't yeah. matter if it's exempt or non-exempt. So exempt employees are like attorneys in our offices. Those would be exempt. They're basically a salaried employee. And you have to pay them, regardless of whether or not they work, unless there's three ways. You can do an unpaid furlough. Like that happened in the recession, in the Great Recession. A lot of people were on unpaid furloughs. You can do a mandated vacation. Go take your vacation. Get your vacation pay. Um, You can do a fixed salary and base hours reduction. Um, That's an amount where the work of an employee can do during a pandemic. So you can limit that work and and limit their salary a little bit to adjust to how much they can actually work during this time frame. It's just 
that's a good distinction for everybody to understand. Yeah, and people are going to feel really sorry for lawyers if they have issues going on with that. I, you know, if, if they can't get paid and employers aren't paying them. I think the country's going to have a real soft heart for the lawyers. I'm sure they're going to have, yes. a, what do they call those, uh, GoFundMe. GoFundMe. GoFundMe go, 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 go for lawyers. Go yeah, yeah, they yeah. Feel, because yeah. They, the country's going to feel really sorry I'm for sure us. Really. Well, I'm sure of that. One thing that I would point out is for your, for your non-exempt employees that you send home or that you don't require to show up to work. Again, if, if they show up and then you have to send them home, there, there may be that uh, show up pay that you have to pay a minimum of a certain number of hours if you require them to come in and then you send them home. But if you send them home, and then for some reason, you start calling them at home, yeah. contacting them, asking them to do something and all of that. Well, now you just put them back on the clock. OK, so if you don't want to pay them and you send them home and you're not going to pay them, you can't be asking them to do stuff because now they're back on the clock and, and you're going to have to pay them. So, you know, yeah, if, that's if, very if, true. If, if you expect them to take the hit, you have to honor it as the employer as well. Exactly. That's so. very true. And I think we all need to say that we have the utmost sympathy for people in the service industry and in the travel industry and yeah. in the broadcasting industry right. that are getting hammered by this. Oh, think of the hammered of the, 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 the yeah. everyone's like, oh, the airlines, they're getting hammered. That's coming back right. because we have to fly to that. But it's the cruise line industry that's that's not a required thing that you have to do. I think they're in trouble because because you know the argument is, and again I'm not agreeing with this, but they're saying you know there's a cesspool. You're all together of germs, and I think people are now gonna think twice about going on those. I think they'll, they're gonna struggle. They they could very well. I wanted to talk. If, I don't, do you have anything more with the uh... Uh, just just a quick thing on the workers' comp issue sure. um, with regard to it, it has to be caught in the workplace. So they right. have to actually prove that they right. caught it in right. the workplace. That's exactly right. Um, and then if they do and it's not occupationally um, related, so they didn't catch it there. If you have disability policy benefits for your employees, you have to give them the disability yeah, benefits. Yeah, no, there's dis- disability, and they got Social Security disability. That's they right. Do, a so and if they state. go on spring break and catch it on spring break, then that's a disability issue. Right. If they come to work and catch it at work, then it's so a workers separate comp. Thing, workers' comp. But like, yeah. I wonder how they can prove that. That's so difficult to prove. They can't. Given, given it's going to be impossible. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be difficult. Go ahead. Okay, so, so what I want to talk about here is just getting back to Eight, the— Why don't you get the phone number, too? 855-LAW-RADIO, Yeah, that's 855-529-7234. Just talking really quickly about what I have heard, and I know that this has concerned a lot of people, when states, and several states have said this, have made the announcement that they are no longer going to be arresting people for low-level misdemeanors, petty theft, low-level drug crimes, uh, things of that nature, and, and... you really have to pay attention to what is being said and what is not being said. Because all they are saying if these is that they're not going to place the person under arrest. It doesn't mean that the person escapes prosecution. And and I know you think, well, so what's going to happen? Well, if if the officer goes out, let's say it's a petty theft, somebody's going to go steal something from some store and they get caught by loss prevention, the police show up, rather than taking that person into the jail to then be booked and then the person either makes bail or they're released on their own recognizance because it's low level, they're going to get out anyway and the bail's probably pretty low for an offense like that. The officer, rather than doing that, would just issue what's called a promise to appear that the individual signs. And it has a court date because they've coordinated with the courts. Okay, you show up in this date and they're usually a month to, you know, six weeks out. And this event here, it's probably going to be more like two and a half to three months. And you have to show up to court. And I know folks are going to say, well, so they sign it and leave. What's the likelihood that those folks would actually show up? I got news for you. The promise to appear methodology is used all the time. When somebody gets arrested and they're sent to jail and the jail is sitting there looking at all their space and they got a choice between keeping the rapist in jail or the guy that tried to steal a 40 ounce beer from Walmart, who are we going to release on their own recognizance to economize space? The thief is going to go. And what do they release him with? A promise to appear. And if the person doesn't show up, then an arrest warrant issues for them. And the next, and I hate to say it, but by and large, people that get arrested once 
tend to get arrested again. And when they do, it shows up. Oh, do you know you got a warrant out for your arrest for your failure to appear in Joe, Joe, Joe court? Yes. And they're taken back in. And, and it, it's and, not that they're going to escape prosecution, folks. That's the that's point. the point. So and the even and, yeah. and even if it's just a traffic infraction and you fail to appear, a civil bench warrant can issue. It doesn't necessarily always have to be a criminal. That's right. You could have a civil bench warrant issues that has the same thing. Now I wanted to raise the one in Florida. The, there was a man who worked for a hotel and he was arrested, folks, for stealing 66 rolls of toilet paper oh, from that the hotel. hotel. At oh. the hotel. At the hotel. Yeah, I've seen signs on people like going to. I was filling up with gas, and there's a sign on you know where you pull their uh, to wash your window, and they have the little towels. To, to, they said this is only for our patrons, not for people taking stuff. You know, I could just see people mm-hmm. doing that. Yeah, I used to leave out in our ba- bathrooms extra toilet paper like on the the top of the toilet. Yeah. I don't do that anymore because they disappear. Also, be cautious of what you use as a substitute for toilet tissue. In the community of Redding, California, the sewer department was called out because one of the main T lines was blocked right. because some family decided that torn up T shirts were an acceptable substitute for toilet tissue. Oh wow! They are not. I when I used to, I had younger <laughs> siblings and I used to wash their diapers out. This is when they had the oh, diapers. The old days, diapers. Yeah. Uh, and right, right. there was a couple times that I just let it go down the toilet and, oh, man. and it blocked oh, up. Denise. And my family was so mad. My parents were so mad. Gee, I wonder why. <laughs> <laughs> you weren't on a septic system, were you? That's just terrible. No, <laughs> no, no, but it didn't matter. Still plugged everything. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a, there, there, so, so we got a guy arrested for uh, stealing toilet paper. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit when we come back, hour number three about a number of important things. We're going to talk about martial law. And Denise, we talked about this. There's a huge difference between the federal and state martial law. Fed is martial, M-A-R-S-H-A-L-L or L. Uh, state is martial, M-A-R-T-I-A-L, martial law. It's a difference, but yet it's the same. Again, not to be confused with marital law. Marital, exactly. that's exactly right. <laughs> Although and, it may feel the same. And we are going to talk about, you know, let's, some of the industries are going to be hurt the worst by this coronavirus uh, outbreak. And uh, are the bankruptcy attorneys going to gonna roll in on this? And the answer is probably yes. We're going to talk about that. And then we're going to do speed, like speed dating, we do speed law. I mean, we're going to talk about, really quickly, Michael Avenatti, Weinstein. We're going to talk about Katy Perry. Uh, and then we're going to talk about the Supreme Court case, how it affects. Todd's going to talk about how it's affecting some Supreme Court cases. Don't forget. There's trials coming up. Man, it was crazy. Our law firm had trials, but we've been preparing for for years. And boom, we're pushing it off. And our just it's just shutting down a lot of the courts and a lot of the business around the country. We'll be back. Hang in there. If you don't if you don't have toilet paper, just call a friend. Phone a friend. <laughs> Good luck on that. Radio Law Talk will continue momentarily right here. We hope you can stay tuned. Uh, This hour is completed, but we have more coming up in just six minutes, basically, right here. Don't go away. Go to the website, radiolawtalk.com. That's radiolawtalk.com. 